been exploring the election of Bill Emerson and how it changed the political landscape in Southeast Missouri. The last episode, we discussed redistricting, which happened in 1981, and it moved Congressman Emerson into a newly created 8th Congressional District. He had to make the decision for, to move from DeSoto to Cape Girada, and we're here to discuss that today with his chief of staff once again. Welcome Lloyd Smith. Thank you, Barry. Welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be here. Lloyd, in previous episodes, we discussed how Bill Emerson crossed party lines and um, he converted a lot of Democrats to vote for the Republican, which was Congressman Emerson. And you're one of those converts yourself, correct? Yes, sir. I grew up a uh, Democrat in Mississippi County. Uh, as a lot of our southern counties down here, there were very few Republicans. Uh, you go to town on Saturday to buy groceries and uh, you could point them out. There's one, there's <laughs> one, and there's one. I think there were three in East Prairie. And so, yeah, I, uh, I changed from being a Democrat to being a Republican, basically in that Reagan-Emerson uh, concept of 1980. But throughout your career with the Emersons, there were still a lot of Democrats that voted for Bill Emerson and Joan Emerson for that matter. But who coined the term Democrat? Because there still was a lot of Democrats voting for yeah. Emerson. Yeah, there was, you know, they, they couldn't uh, really call themselves Republican, and they still wanted to hold their Democrat allegiance, certainly at the county, state rep, state senate level, and statewide level. But they began to believe that Bill Emerson was representing them in a way that, that they approved of. And Ralph Clayton, who ran the newspaper in Carothersville, Missouri, ran a editorial saying he had been won over, he wasn't a Republican, but he was an Democrat. That's a Democrat who's going to vote for Bill Emerson. It was wow. a lot. It was uh, it was Bill Emerson's favorite editorial, by the way. Uh, we actually put it on the back of a tabloid. Uh, we used to do inserts every campaign in every newspaper in the district, and the entire back page of the tabloid was nothing more than the Democrat editorial from the Democrat Argus out of Carothersville, Missouri, written by Ralph Clayton. So that actually turned into a good uh, campaign flyer for you then, right? Oh, absolutely. We, we, uh, we had it on the back of the uh, tabloid. We also uh, used it in newspaper ads. We used it in TV ads. We used it in radio ads. Uh, we used uh, the terminology became kind of a bridge for people that were Democrats to be able to vote Republican. But basically, they were voting for Bill Emerson, and they called themselves, I'm not a Republican, but I'm an Democrat. Well, 1980 kind of marked the first, kind of the first era which Republicans kind of started taking over. That was kind of the initiation of the Republican Party in Southeast Missouri. Yeah. But he still had a lot of Democratic support. How did he hang on to that Democratic support over the years? You know, we did a lot of different things. I mean, you know, in the, in the 82 campaign, we had Democrats for Emerson. We actually had a state senator out of Cape Girardeau in 1982 that uh, endorsed Bill, uh, a guy named Al Spradling, mm -hmm. and he would have been a Democratic state senator. So we, we used that leverage to pull people over. And uh, we, we ended up with like former Democrat office holders. Now some wouldn't do it uh, if they were still a Democratic office holder in office, they would, might not endorse Bill. But we got a lot of former Democratic uh, office holders to endorse. And at that point, it, it became easier for people to uh, vote for Bill Emerson even if they were a Democrat. So the transition was starting and it, it was been a big transition for oh, yeah. 40 years, 30 yeah, years? Yeah, the, 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 the transition really began. You know, we, everyone thinks that it just happened overnight and that's not true. Uh, we had one Republican uh, rep in 1982 and no Republican state senators. And if we speed all the way forward to uh, when Bill uh, passed away in 1996, uh, we had just about every uh, Democrat had been defeated uh, and in some cases, uh, we had one or two actually change parties and run as a Republican after having been a Democrat. Lloyd, we spent a lot of time with Wayne Kratz lately, and he was your opponent in 1986 and 1988. You know, Bill was instrumental in getting those bankruptcy laws changed where yeah. it benefited the farmers in the area. Yeah. You know, if a granary goes under, you know, because of legislation that Bill helped pass, yeah. you know, that can't happen anymore. Yeah. When I finally decided that the only way I knew to make changes was try to get involved and in, inside the system and work from that way. Before, I'd always worked outside the system. So when I made that decision, one of the first people I told was Bill Emerson. I was in Washington, D.C. I went in, 
And, you know, you couldn't help like Bill Emerson. I mean, he was a really likable guy and everything. And when I sat down and I looked at Bill right in the eye and I said, Bill, I said, I've decided to run for Congress. I've decided to run against you. And he said, Wayne, <laughs> you know, me and your friends, and you're going to run against me? And I said, yes, Bill. I said, you know, you're the one of the greatest politicians I've ever made met. But Bill, you're the worst representative our district's ever had. And I went through the different things that was happening to our district since he got elected. And the policies that he was pursuing and voting for, I believed was bringing that type of problems to our district. And that's why I decided to run against Bill Emerson. Were you surprised that Wayne Kratz ran against you guys in 1986 and 88? You know, I think uh, maybe we saw it coming uh, in uh, late 84, but actually uh, he came forward and told Bill he was gonna run on December 23rd, 1985. And the reason I remember the date, it's important. Uh, it was the final day of the deliberation of the Farm Bill in the U.S. Congress, and it happens to be my wedding anniversary, the 23rd of December, and he said, I'm going to run. So that was December of 85. He actually uh, told Bill Emerson, I'm going to run against you in 1986. We had worked quite closely with uh, Wayne. We'd actually been to see him. We flew to Russellville, Arkansas when he was in jail after he had uh, uh, refused a court order to testify. I think uh, that was part of the reason that we kept that close communication. We also worked extremely closely with uh, Bob Dole at the time, who was the senator from Kansas. It was pretty interesting the way the, the, the law was written and how we changed it so that a farmer had better standing than just a bunch of unsecured creditors when their product was in storage in an elevator that went bankrupt. In our last episode, Lloyd, you stated that Bill Emerson did a lot of listening. He had a lot of these listening tours where he got in a, like a mobile van yeah. and he actually went around to town to town, city to city, yeah. and he actually listened, listened to farmers yeah. and the issues that were important to the farmers. What was some of the important legislation? I think there was the Good Samaritan Food Act maybe. Oh, what were some of the legislation that you were involved in that Bill Emerson actually got passed? You know, uh, well, let's take that one. Uh, uh, the Good Samaritan, basically, uh, there were laws on the books that uh, restaurants and grocery stores, once a, a food item was uh, out of date, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't sell it. And uh, there was really good food that was left over at a restaurant that, that couldn't even go to, let's say, a local soup kitchen. And so he, he passed that legislation with the help of a lot of early urban members of Congress because it was needed to feed the people. Uh, the bankruptcy law uh, you also talked about. We worked on a lot of individual situations that came out of some of that casework. You know, sometimes when you listen, you learn there's a problem in the statute. Mm -hmm. We had a case where a man was sent from Cape Girardeau, Missouri with a heart condition to have his disability reviewed under Social Security. They sent him to Kennett to have a treadmill. There are no cardiologists in Kennett. He had a heart attack on the treadmill. Now, fortunately, he lived, but they had to take him, I think, to Memphis or to Jonesboro to the hospital because there wasn't a cardiologist in Kennedy at the time. We were able to force then, through legislation, the Social Security Administration can't send you someplace to have a test run that, where there are not the capabilities of solving your health care problem. Again, that was because of listening. Mm -hmm. It was listening on bankruptcy. It was, uh, that's the reason we worked to change that law. It was listening uh, to the people that wanted to give their food to entities where the people were hungry, but there was a barrier there. By listening, we worked to change the barrier in the same way with that description about Social Security disability. You listened, you did a case, you found out there was a problem, and you solved the problem because you had listened to the person that had it. Well, Lloyd, that's a good point. And you know, we always want to hear about the legislation and all the big things that all our congressmen and women do, but really it boils down to constituent services, right? Because everybody's got some type of problem in their life, yeah. you know, politics yeah. or religion or yeah. whatever. So, yeah. you know, it's the, it's the, the constituent relationship that Bill Emerson and, 
Yeah. Lloyd Smith had with the 8th District that really made it successful, right? Well, we, we, we started out with a thing called a mobile office that made tours all around the district. We gathered information. If you had a problem with the federal government or even state government, we would try with state government work as a liaison to try to solve that problem. If it was with the federal government, we tried to do the same thing. A part of it was just to show that government could be with the people mm -hmm. and help solve problems. And you know, I remember the minister that time that gave the uh, gave the sermon. He said, "Not, not all God's children got shoes, but all God's children got troubles." And if you listen, you can learn. And if you learn, sometimes you can make a difference in their lives in the way they're going to connect with state government or federal government. And it was important for us to do that. And he was, it came from the top. Uh, Bill Bill expected us to function that way. And uh, when I became his chief of staff, uh, we, we made it uh, our legacy, actually. And we did it even all the way down to the classroom level, uh, holding things called Congress in the classroom to listen to what teachers had to say and what students had to say. And it made a difference, I think, in, in uh, making you a better representative because you've been listening. The outreach by Bill Emerson was second to none, right? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, you know, I mean, uh, we would uh, we we held uh, events right here in Malden uh, at the community center. A lady one time was so nervous she couldn't hardly speak, and uh, I told Bill and he said, uh, "We'll bring her in. Let's talk to her." And he brought her in and he pointed at me and he said, "Now he's not the most important person in this room." And he pointed at himself and he said, "I'm not the most important person in this room." And he pointed at that lady and he said, "You're the most important person in this room." So this. Take a nice sip of water and tell us what's on your mind and we'll see if we can help. He was that personal with the constituents, wasn't he? He was that personal, yeah, absolutely. You know, Lloyd, when I first invite, invited you to the show, I just, it was really, I just wanted to document the history of the Emerson machine. Uh, you've taught me a lot about the Emersons I didn't know, some I did know, but you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, good and bad. It wasn't always easy, no. especially right when you first started, right? No. <laughs> and there were some hard times, like he checked himself into an alcohol treatment facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was something bad that happened in his life, mm -hmm. probably in your life. Mm -hmm. But it's some some good come out of it. So sure. explain that time period yeah. in your life and Bill yeah. Emerson's life. It was uh, uh, it was during the 1988 campaign. So it was the second Wayne Kreitz campaign, and it didn't really affect the campaign either, right? Well, I mean, on, on the surface, maybe not. But there there was a lot of things that went on in the campaign, uh, but. Uh, we, we sat down with Bill and his family and some of his close friends and shared with him what we saw. And uh, he saw it too. Uh, his daughter was actually there. And uh, he made the decision to go to Betty Ford in the spring of 1988 and uh, came back after uh, 28 days and had lost some weight and uh, was, uh, you know, he knew he had a problem, uh, began to go to meetings and, uh, and help others. Uh, made a difference in the campaign uh, because now rather than just work 12, 14 hours a day, he decided that we ought to work 16 hours a day <laughs> from the point he came back from Betty Ford in California through the election in November. Uh, we were very successful that year. Uh, we won by a much larger margin than we had two years earlier running against the same person. Uh, there was a lot of commercials that went back and forth that were pretty tough. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, almost to the point of maybe too tough. And, uh, but by him admitting he had a problem, taking care of the problem, we saw our numbers, with, particularly with uh, women, married women, uh, climb. The confidence level they had in someone that would admit his problem and go forward with it uh, made a big difference. Joanne came out and ran a separate campaign with him. We would have them go uh, in different directions during the day, end up in an event at night, the next day do the same thing. So we actually would make 16 to 20 stops in a day, Bill making anywhere from eight to 10, and Joanne making eight to 10 separately, and then come back together that evening for a main event uh, for one day, and then the next day do it all over again. And we did that all the way from uh, May through November. Was that really the first campaign that Miss Emerson was involved in, like day to day? No, I, I guess the, both 80 and 82, she was really involved uh, because they had made that decision to move back to DeSoto from Washington, D.C. She was really involved in that one, uh, really involved in 82, although she was expecting uh, Catherine, the, their second daughter, 
and uh, she, Catherine was actually born during that campaign of 1982. Uh, but then 86, she was back some during what we called Kreitz One, and then in 88, she was here a lot uh, after the Betty Ford experience. I don't want to breeze over this because the Betty Ford experience helped so many people after Congressman Emerson came back because they started getting involved in programs to help other congressmen and women that have this problem try to yeah. cope with it, right? Yeah. And, and staffers. And staffers. Uh, you know, we had, uh, he came back with, a, with you know, part of the 12-step program at, at the end is, is to help others. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started uh, several meetings on the Hill. He uh, did it both the House and the Senate side and both with staff on House and Senate side, which made a difference, I think, in lives and it helped strengthen his resolve to uh, stay sober. And uh, he was uh, very committed to it all the way through and until his death in 1996. And I think those programs that he helped create in Congress are still viable today, probably even better now. Oh yeah, I think, I think everything has changed a great deal. You know, when, when he went to Betty Ford in 1988, uh, it shocked a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the lead story on KFES. It was the lead story in every newspaper in the district. But uh, the way he conducted himself following that and his commitment to the cause of uh, helping others with addictions, I think strengthened him and I think helped a lot of people in the progress, in, in, the, in the program in the future. Well, Lloyd, Bill Emerson had to work across the aisle the whole time he was in office. His last term was the only time he was in the majority, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, we, uh, in 1994, uh, you know, we had the contract with America. It was uh, two years into the Bill Clinton uh, presidency. Uh, Newt Gingrich came up with the 10 steps of the contract. Uh, Bill Emerson at first wasn't going to run in 1994. Uh, he had thought about running for the Senate, and Ashcroft ran instead. And then he finally decided, well, let's do this. He won in 1994, so when he was in the chair uh, on the first day of the Republicans being in control in 1995, it was the first time uh, that Republicans had been in control in 40 years, and uh, he got to chair. He was one of the five people that chaired on that first day. So from January of 95 until June of 96, Bill Emerson was in the majority. But up until then, uh, we had to do what we call a lot of compromise, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, uh, working with across the aisle to achieve the goals for the district. So he had worked uh, most of his career, just about all of it, 90% of it, in the minority, not in the majority. Well, Lloyd, as you know, we're in this, this era, environment of hyper-partisanship. Um, how do you think Bill would have operated in this environment? I know it was a different era, it's a different time period, but yeah. how do you think Bill Emerson would have operated in this hyper-partisan environment? You know, uh, I've thought about that because, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those, that, you know, a problem solver. Mm -hmm. I, I think he would have been fine, but I think he would have changed the tone. Uh, I always thought that Bill Emerson would have been the Speaker of the House uh, if he had lived. He had that kind of uh, uh, support among his colleagues on the Republican side, and he was, he was willing to work extremely hard, and he loved the institution of the Congress. I think he would have helped change the tone. I think he would have surrounded himself with leadership types that would have helped change the tone. And that's a good point that you just made. You didn't say it exactly like I'm fixing to ask you the question, but compromise is a good thing, right? It, it always has been in my life. <laughs> you know, I've, I'm soon to uh, celebrate my 49th wedding anniversary, and I can assure you, you don't achieve that goal without a great deal of compromise. And there's sometimes, you know, you have, to, you have to put yourself in the other guy's shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's an urban member of Congress from Los Angeles or New York, or it's a rural member of Congress from West Virginia or Mississippi or Alabama, you have to think, okay, they're bringing to the table certain concerns, certain life experiences. So what in this legislation touches their life and what can we do to make it different? And can we make it something that more people will support? Because when you get that kind of push, then I think that helps you for the public to see that people are working together for the public good and not just for the politics. You know, Lloyd, Bill Emerson's legacy was that of compromise because he turned the 8th Congressional District from blue to red. And that is a testament to his compromise. Absolutely. And uh, we, we worked with, uh, I, I mean, I, 
You know, before we had all the Republican state reps and state senators that, that exist now, I mean, we, had to work, we worked with the Democrat state senators across the district, mm -hmm. Republicans uh, across the district. But we worked with Democrat state reps across the district on issues in the Mark Twain National Forest, on the Mississippi River, uh, on the, you know, the Oz Ozark National Scenic Riverways. Many of those areas have state parks and federal interest and they were, may have been represented by a Democrat. The, the goal was to, what's best for the people of Carter and Ripley County? What's best for the people of Texas County? Or what's best for the people in St. Francis County? Not necessarily what's best for the politics of the next, next election. Bill Emerson was diagnosed with lung cancer while in office. Did that impact his effectiveness as a congressman at all? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, uh, lung cancer is extremely serious. Uh, it's almost, uh, uh, now it's not nearly as fatal as it was in the, in the mid 90s. Uh, Bill had only been in the majority. We had talked just a few moments ago about him being in the chair in January of 1995. Uh, it was October of 1995 uh, when I was uh, in the office in Cape Girardeau and Bill called to tell me that he had been diagnosed with lung cancer and that it was extremely serious. And uh, he asked me to go tell his mother. And he said, I said, well, you mean tell her? He goes, no, I just want you to be there when I call her. And so I actually went out, Marie's his mom, and uh, there in mid-October of 1995, I uh, went out and, and uh, it was funny. I said, Maria, Bill's gonna call in a few minutes. And she goes, is my Billy sick? And I said, well, Bill's gonna call in a few minutes. Anyway, he called and talked to her. So how effective he was, he went into uh, a series of treatments. Uh, he went to uh, Sloan Kettering in New York. Uh, they came up with a protocol of treatment that could be uh, completed there in Washington, D.C. And uh, he started treatments pretty early. Uh, it was inoperable type of lung cancer. Uh, Bill was a heavy smoker, uh, had been for years. Uh, you know, he gained a little weight uh, after, after the Betty Ford experience because uh, I think he supplanted uh, alcohol with ice cream. And, and so he, uh, he had been a heavy smoker. And so he went into a series of treatments in uh, late uh, 1995, but he missed very few votes uh, all the way up until uh, it was time to file. Uh, he actually filed by mail, which is almost impossible to do. And, uh, but he, he worked extremely hard, uh, even on those days where he had to have oxygen and was in a wheelchair, uh, he still made it to the floor to vote, uh, all the way up until Bob Dole resigned from uh, the uh, Senate in uh, June of 96. To uh, run for president, I to guess. To run for president. And when he did, Bill actually went there for the resignation so he could hear it firsthand and was sitting in the front row. And I think Bob Dole even acknowledged him in the remarks because Bill had worked for a member of Congress early on in his career from uh, uh, Kansas and then later on worked for a member of Congress from Maryland. So uh, before his death in, in 1996, uh, he only missed a handful of votes. Uh, his oldest daughter of the union of he and Joanne had graduated from uh, high school in May of that year and he made it to his daughter's uh, graduation. And so it was a difficult time for all of us though, between October of 1995 and June 22nd of 1996. But we kept, we kept going, we kept doing things. He actually made one trip home to the district. Uh, there's actually a film clip of that. Uh, I think I've shared it with some of the guys here. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell he had lost weight and, and was going through some uh, I guess the side effects of chemotherapy. Uh, some days were really, really good and some days were pretty tough. Uh, we spent a lot of time together during that period of time. Well, Bill passed away prior to the 1996 election and Joanne Emerson actually won his seat in a special election. Yeah. Did Bill, was Bill planning on running for re-election? Uh, what was the, yeah. I mean, you were the campaign manager, chief of staff, I yeah. guess, kind of working both yeah. ways there. What was the environment going on around there? Did you really know what was going on or was it a 
fluid situation? Well, it was somewhat fluid, but Bill filed for re-election. Uh, he was on the ballot in 1996. Uh, Emily Fireball Ferguson, uh, out of uh, Madison County, uh, out of Fredericktown, a former school teacher. She, actually. Is, she is a fireball, too. She is a fireball, too. <laughs> That's right. And uh, she had actually taught school at one point in Sykeston. Uh, she was on the ballot uh, as the Democrat uh, potential nominee. Of course, you don't know who the nominee is in firm until August of that year. But he had filed for re-election. Uh, we actually thought he might beat this thing. Uh, we, we had seen some really great signs. Uh, some of the tumor had shrank. Uh, he, he was feeling better, uh, certain times better than other times. But uh, it, was, it was a tough time. Uh, did he ever talk about Joanne? running. Not really because until two weeks before he passed away, he was still great guns uh, going to the floor, uh, not coming home that much because the flight would have been really detrimental. But uh, all, all the way up until Father's Day, uh, the Sunday before he passed away, uh, they had a family dinner and, and all of them were together. It's a great story. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a real great story. I, I had actually talked to him uh, uh, three or four days before Father's Day that year and uh, told him I had, was going to a work camp in Arkansas, a Christian work camp, where we actually rehab houses. And I said, you know, if you're feeling bad, I won't go. And he said, no, you need to do that. You need to do the Lord's work. He said, if you're doing the Lord's work, I feel like I'm doing my work by letting you go. And so uh, he told me to go ahead and go, and uh, that's where I was, actually uh, uh, crawling up under a, a uh, mobile home, uh, putting underpinning under it, about 35 miles outside of Russellville, Arkansas, when I got the call that he went in the hospital the day after Father's Day in 1996. And that's where you were at whenever you found out he passed away, you were working on houses? No, I actually uh, hitched a ride from Russellville to Little Rock, Little Rock to St. Louis and uh, flew to Washington, D.C. on that Monday night, uh, got in the, on the red eye, and, uh, and then he was in Walter Reed Hospital. And then from that Monday night, Tuesday, uh, he passed away on Saturday night. So, so you had a feeling something, the end was near. Yes. We, well, I stayed pretty well at the hospital for the next five, five, six days. Lloyd, once again, thanks for coming. Thank you. We've been visiting with Lloyd Smith, Bill Emerson's Chief of Staff. We've been discussing how Bill Emerson transformed Southeast Missouri politics. Join us on our next episode as Lloyd and I discuss Joan Emerson taking over for her late husband and continuing his legacy.